At 17 years old, I was a world kickboxing champion. And then I left Canada to go to Israel to join the IDF, the Israel Defense Force. And then from there, I transitioned to a spying agency. And then I discovered the sport of duathlon. I was the first woman to win the hardest race in the world. As you might know, the race across America, I won it last year. I was the overall winner. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very good indeed. What's your name? I'm Leon. I'm assuming you know who I am. But, I know. Uh, no. I, I think I know more about you than you knew about me, so I should interview you. <laughs> My <laughs> name is Leah Goldstein, and I'm from Canada. You're Leah Goldstein from Canada. Where, where in Canada? I love Canada. Um, you know, about five hours east of Vancouver, British Columbia. So it's called Vernon, BC. It's in the Okanagan. Okay, cool, cool. And um, what's your claim to fame? Oh, gee, this is what makes this very complicated. There's four major things that happened in my life, right? So I thought you were supposed to guess. So I thought, Leon, maybe if I showed you the cover of my book, which will give you some clues, because aren't you supposed to guess who I am, right? Not necessarily. I'm no? just supposed to have a spontaneous conversation. We can go wherever, but show me the cover of your okay, book. Okay, let me show you the cover, and maybe if you you might get. So I, I covered a few things, so I don't know if you can see this. Okay, uh, no limits. Yeah, I can see it. I don't know if you can see. There's a couple of clues in there. You bo boxing gloves. There's boxing gloves. There's a rifle, and there's a bike. <laughs> Are you an Olympian? I'm not an Olympian, but okay. was close. You're a triathlete. Not a triathlete. Okay, you're someone who likes adventure and pushing yourself to the limits. Absolutely. And inspiring people with your stories. Bang on, you get, you're very close, yes. <laughs> you're very good at this. <laughs> so what? who exactly are you? What's your story? Well, okay, well, my biggest fame, I'm going to say, started when I was very young. I, um, at 17 years old, I was a world uh, kickboxing champion. And then I left Canada to go to Israel to join the IDF, the Israel Defense Force. Um, and then from there, I transitioned to a spying agency called the Belouch. And I was there for about, I'm going to say, 11 years. And then I discovered the sport of duathlon. Um, but the bike was kind of the passion and I wanted, and I just left everything Leon and I came back to pursue a cycling career at 30 years old, um, which I was very successful in multiple championships. But my biggest victory, I'm going to say is, um, ultra endurance cycling. I was the first woman to win the hardest race in the world. As you might know, the race across America, I won it last year. I was the overall winner. So that was probably wow. what is that favorite. race? What's the race exactly? That race, um, it's from Oceanside, California, right across to Annapolis, Maryland. And the tricky thing is you only got 12 days to do it, right? So the clock basically starts when it starts and whatever happens, happens. So, you know, you're facing, you know, elements of sleep deprivation, mother nature, hallucinations and whatnot, right? Um, yeah, so that was the biggest thing. That's kind of where my passion is. And I always, when I was pro racing, I was on the circuit for about 10 years. And I knew that was kind of more my thing. Because the harder, the longer the race, um, I excelled better more at the, the back part. And also my ability to stay very functional with very little sleep. Because with RAM, you know, you're only sleeping in a 48-hour period between zero to three hours. So, you know, you kind of have to navigate everything that happens physically and mentally, you know, during that, you know, time of the race. Wow. So how long does it take to finish that race? Um, well, because of the heat, though, as you know, that that was that was kind of the biggest challenge because last year only three there was only three finishers because we hit temperatures of close to 50 Celsius, which is, I think, 110 Fahrenheit. I don't know what, you know, if you're metric or not. Um, so, yeah, there's only three of us that finished. I came in uh, at 11 days, 17 hours after me came in the first man. And then the last guy came in about 30 minutes after the first man. So wow. that was it. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty amazing. I noticed you said that you worked for 11 years in a spying agency. Correct. What was the name of the spying agency? It's called the Belouche. And is, is that Israeli? Correct. 
Yes. Okay. You see, Leon, when I was, yeah, I knew what I wanted to do from when I was seven years old, right? And that was to work in some form of secret intelligence. I didn't know what at the time, only because I knew it existed in my family, right? And things were always very secretive. Like when I grew up, my mother was very um, adamant about my sister and I being careful of saying things on the phone or who we make friends with, or my parents would, you know, my parents speak like five different languages. So if they didn't want my sister and I to understand something, they would swap languages, right? So it was so intriguing to me of what's going on here. You know, like I said, members of my family, I would see maybe once every five years. And there was something about them that just drew me to, to whatever they were doing. I didn't understand it when I was young, but it just got more like the intensity or the, the willingness to do whatever they were doing got stronger. And I realized it was something in security. So that kind of James Bond was my, <laughs> was my goal when I was seven. <laughs> and you became Jane Bond. Jane Bond, <laughs> Leia Bond. <laughs> yeah, Leia Bond, Leia Bond. So, so it's fascinating. What years were you in the agency for? Well, I was, you know, I after I won the world championship at seventeen, I left Canada to, and we're we're from Israel. Like I was, I was made in Israel. I was born in Canada. So my mom was seven months pregnant. So, well, actually, my mom was born northern China. My father, Soviet Union. My sister in Israel, but they met in Israel, and then my father left because he saw opportunity in Canada. But we, I, but all our family is is in Israel. So I decided that after winning that, like that was kind of the, my career move when I was younger, that I was going to join the Israel Defense Force, which you have to, as you know, every citizen must do the military. Women do two years and men do three years, whether you like it or not. So in the military, Leon, I was picked up by a fighting unit called Krav Maga, which is, I don't know if you've heard of that term. Yeah, before. I've heard of it. I've heard yeah, of it. So it's a Hebrew, when a Krav means um, fight and Maga means hand, so lethal hand combat. And every soldier must learn this form of self-defense. So they, because of my kickboxing and Taekwondo background, they put me in a base called base eight, right? And in that specific um, department of the military, it's a military intelligence base. And that's kind of how my kind of career started, right? You know, when they saw the, my ability, not only physically, but mentally. And so that's kind of the, the seed of how everything happened in the Middle East. But what is it? Well, you say you worked as a, a spy, basically, right? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. But but what is it? I I don't know what you can say, but you you told me that you worked as a kind of a spy, maybe. Insecure, but yeah. What can you tell me anything about like an operation that you did? Something where you because I'm fascinated with with that world as well. Like, can you tell me something that that you did as a maybe a spy? Right. Well, see. Like, as you know, our age, the biggest agency, of course, is um, the Shabak and the Mossad, right? You know, so, you know, you don't seek them, they seek you. So, but there are many, many branches of intelligence, right? So you don't know where you're going and you don't talk about it and you go where you go, right? You know, so, um, so I was picked up by an a agency, actually, I mean, let me just go back so you'll understand how it all happened. You know, that huge immigration that came in um, from the Soviet Union, Gorbachev allowed 1.4 million immigrants into the country, right? Yeah. And during that time, Yakov Turner, who was a brigadier general, he was the police commissioner. And so what was happening with that huge immigration is crimes that were generally on a small scale, such as narcotics, prostitution, drug trafficking, started to escalate. And as you know, Israel deals with terrorism and the Russian mafia started to come in. So they wanted to create a secret police force in order to control those issues and in hopes of recruiting immigrants that had some kind of police, military or intelligence background. So for me, I don't look Israeli. And my training from Israel, you know, I was above and beyond kind of qualified for this, this kind of um, experimental government project. And so I was put into that department working internally right, kind of to deal with those issues and kind of control the crimes that were happening inside the country, because the country was starting to crumble. And as you know, Israel can't afford to crumble, right? you know, we have to stay strong for obvious reasons. You know, so I actually was in that department for most of my intelligence, we're going to call it career. Are there any like stories you can share? Maybe? Um, I mean, I can tell you, I mean, uh, like, well, my first day is probably a, fun, a funny story I can tell you. I mean, so when I was recruited for the Belouche, like what happened is, you know, I, was, I didn't know where I was going. Like the police department picked me up and then 
after three months, and mind you, I was denied. It was a lot of discrimination, as you can know, during that time. So it was a it was a big fight to get into where I got into, right? You know, because that particular government project wasn't open to women. I had to get special permission from the from the chief of police, from the commissioner, to go into that, right? You know, so it was kind of a little bit of a hurdles to, to get into that. But anyways, I ended up graduating in the top three. So after three months in uniform, right, you know, because you have to start somewhere. All of a sudden, I was asked to go to this department of this, you know, the police station where I didn't even know existed. Um, and so when I went in for an interview, I was being interviewed by the head of that department, the spying agency called the Belouche. And they were kind of watching me from the beginning. And in order to get into that department, you need three to four years of police experience to even be considered. I was three months. So they kind of never had a woman. They watched me. They saw what I could do. And they started, they said, you know, it's about time. And, you know, so because I did a lot of things, even in base eight, like with the, I was the first female instructor to train the commando. So I did a lot of things that men couldn't do, like physically, right? I mean, I was petite, but still very agile, right? And, you know, muscle strength wise, whatever, pretty good for my size, right? Um, so he, you know, he said he wanted kind of watching me and putting me on probation, right? So they basically squeezed in three years of training into one month. And this is the real deal. This is profiling, interrogation, learning, you know, new form of weapons, new form of self-defense. Um, my training would include like taking me to big cities like Tel Aviv or whatever. We'd walk in through the towns or whatever. He'd point to certain people and I'd have to identify them based on their eyes, the color of their skin, the way they talk, the way they look. If they were Israeli, if they were Ashkenazi, if they were, you know, I Iranian, if they were whatever, from whatever country, you know, I'd have to learn to talk with you and, and listen to three other conversations or have, you know, to get your phone number, to get your whatever, to get into your car. <laughs> so it was very, very, very intense, right? That's the kind of training that I was put through. Um, so on my first, I don't know if you want to hear my very first day with the Belouche, right? Um, we usually work with two agents work together. And now we work in these pimped up at, at that time, you know, the Ford Escorts, they were bulletproof today, kind of just kind of so we blend into the country. So we're not so noticeable. Right. So as we're going out for an assignment, I think it was some kind of drugs coming in from from Beirut or from Lebanon. I don't remember. Right. Because we worked internally with other agencies. But as we're going out of the parking lot, you know, our commander says abort the biggest drug dealer or whatever terrorist criminal that the Belush would have been after for like five years was seen in a neighboring city. And the command was, we, we don't come back to the station, you know, whether, you know, otherwise, you know, we'll bring him in dead or alive, basically, right? So that's like five minutes into my first whatever. So we whipped to this area, it was called Orakiva, right? And remember, this is my very first day <laughs> sitting in the back of the car. And, you know, um, I, there's tension, you know, both the driver and the other agent, whatever, they, I mean, they start sweating in an air-conditioned car. And as we're approaching Orakiva, the driver yells, Totsi, Totsi, which means get out of the car. And the car is still moving. So the driver jumps out of the car. I jump out of the car. And as I jump out, Leon, my hip hits the door, right? Really hard. I swear to God, I thought I cracked it. But the adrenaline is pumping. And I start running. And I see this one individual, whatever. And he's a big guy. He's running really fast. And I thought, oh, crap, it's, that's him. I just had a gut feeling, right? So he runs into an old building, right? And back then in Israel, we didn't have elevators. It was it was stairs. And then to see it, you'd have little buttons that would illuminate. Now he knew somebody was chasing him, but he didn't know who was chasing him, right? So we get we get to the top of this, you know, abandoned building. He's knocking, he's banging on the door because there was a door at top. And I yelled at him, you know, you're under arrest. So he hears a woman's voice and he turns around, he turns the light on and he almost starts laughing because I was like the size of his left thigh. Right. You know, so in order to, you know, contain him, I have to reach down to grab my Beretta. Right. So I reach down to to grab it because otherwise he's going to break my neck. Right. So as I'm reaching down, there is like, you know, there's nothing there. Right. And I'm praying to God, even Jesus Christ. And I'm Jewish, you know, that when I hit my hip on that door, that my holster shifted to the other side. But it didn't shift the, the cover of the gun. You know, it, it I opened it up and the gun had fallen out. Right. So. I'm completely, I mean, I had a little blade on the inside of my, you know, lower left leg or whatever, but at this point, I have no choice. I have to run. So now, Leon, he's chasing me down the stairs, right? But I could share my backup, whatever, and he tried to do like a, like a football tackle to, to grab me or whatever, and then he ended up tripping, and anyways, we, we ended up, you know, containing him or whatever, but that that's just the story of my very first day. And I thought, oh my God, what, what have I gotten into, right? You know, but from that certain incident, from them finding, I mean, 
the two the two people that were with me kind of gave me the full credit for catching because like I said this guy's been on their radar for many I'm gonna say over five years so being responsible for catching him that solidified me into the Belouche and they had hired me that very first day as a as a permanent you know member of their department wow how, how do you go from that type of adrenaline to like everyday life even though I guess you went from that type type of adrenaline to more adrenaline which was your career uh, in extreme sports well I think there's a certain profile like I'm not super social I don't feel comfortable in large crowds I'm very uh, like a loner kind of thing you know um and they look for people who are like that you know what I mean that um are kind of on the quiet side because they do a lot of like prior to that I got tested a lot through different I don't know if this is an English or psychometry test like you know mental tests to see how I would react to different things. I was shown a lot. I mean, my training, like I said, was very intense, right? And I think, and they were also concerned me on, because I grew up in Canada, which is a very nice country. It's a cushy country. I'm not exposed to what they're exposed to in Israel. So they were worried about my mental ability to handle certain things. Whereas in Israel, they're almost conditioned to. Like kids are, like even if you, a funny example, if you look at our playgrounds, compared to the playgrounds in Israel, right? Our playgrounds, we have a slide and a swing and whatever. The playgrounds in Israel is almost like a military obstacle course. You know what I mean? And it was fun. So it's kids are a lot more, they're more, I'm going to say, um, confident. They're a bit more aggressive because they're exposed to that kind of, you know, mentality. This is their life, right? You know, I mean, it's not saying it's dangerous. It's very safe, but they're always aware, right? Whereas in Canada, we don't have to worry about those things. So there was, there was a bit concern in the agency of how I could handle that mentally, right? Um, which is fine, you know, le legit, right? So that's why the training kind of put me through that, you know, to see how I would handle and certain things I would by any means never be exposed anyone in North America, right? Maybe in the United States, but not in Canada, as you, you know, as you know. So that kind of training was, was the most intense, I think, was, was the physical part and their, you know, their determination to see how I could handle it. And when you talk about why they chose me, um, for one, it's it's very isolating. I could not have any friends. Um, even the people that I work with, like say you and I are partners in work. If I saw you as on our days off or whatever, as a civilian, I cannot acknowledge you. I cannot look at you. I was um, transferred a lot, even within the country, like, you know, in different. So that's kind of an isolating life, which was fine for me because I didn't thrive on that companionship or whatever. I was a good profile for what they needed, if that makes any sense, right? It does. And, and what what did you like about that specific type of work, let's say? It's it was, I think fine. it was the, the well, I'm, I'm an adrenaline seeker, as you can already probably figure out, right? So I think it was that, it was the adrenaline, it was the challenge, it was not knowing what you're getting into, because I went to work, you don't know what the hell is going to happen, right, you know? Um, but mind you, though, during that time, I was still training, like I was doing duathlons, because at that time, there was no cycling for women, right? So I was doing it, and I was competing, and that was kind of my debriefing, right? Because... I mean, honestly, with the work that we did, I don't know how those men that I worked with went back home to their families and just pretended everything was OK, because we saw things that most people don't see. Right. You know what I mean? So that's I mean, and for me, so I just use my bike as kind of the, my salvation. I'd pedal hard or I'd hit the bag or whatnot. Right. So that's how I but I and even debriefing, I didn't even go and speak to other people because I didn't feel like I had to. I was kind of in my own world, almost like somebody autistic. Right. Just. I knew what I had to do and I knew what I had to do in order to control those, you know, those things that would bug you outside of your job. Right. And that's why the retirement age at that type of work is 45 years old. Interesting. Yeah. And, and what, what do you think like are the main things that you need to have in order to be a good spy? Well, for one, I mean, huh, I mean, it's not, you don't know if you are or not. I mean, honestly, Leon, the department that I wanted to go into, I didn't get accepted, right? You know, I can't tell you what happened, but I had done something that I shouldn't have done. And I, uh, yeah, that's kind of a hard, that's kind of a hard part because I'll be honest with you right now. I wanted to go into the Mossad. That was, but I had never, it's the first time I've even said it, you know, on a, I've been on many podcasts, I've never said that before, but it was kind of obvious, I think, right? That's kind of was my big whatever, because I knew, people that were in it, whatever. But it's like I said, you don't seek them. They seek you. So I think I tried a little bit too hard. 
And then when I think I was on that route, I had done something, I had opened my mouth to somebody that I shouldn't have. And Leon, they know everything about you. When I was first interviewed, I was sitting in front of an officer, just lady, very casual. And she asked me, the first question she asked me is, where do I live and how many bedrooms are in my house? I, so I lived in Vancouver at the time. We lived on Fremlin Street. We had a bungalow. There was like four bedrooms and two bedrooms downstairs. And I messed up. I said, oh, there's two bedrooms upstairs. There's three down. And she goes, no, there isn't. You have two upstairs and you have three downstairs. Next question. You know what I mean? So you cannot, they, I mean, they, they know everything about you right from the beginning, right? So there's nothing in Everything is out in the open, right? You know, um, and so I kind of wanted to make myself look a little bit more perfect than what I was and not being completely brutally honest with them. And then I learned that a little bit later because I was very young, right? I mean, I was 19, you know, and just my determination to do whatever. I, but, you know, I guess the, the Belouche, getting into the Belouche was kind of my 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 second option, right, of, of doing what I needed to do. And it ended up to be very good because I did go on different operations outside of that agency and outside of the country. So like I said, I did the things that I wanted to do. But it was I was very delusional about what I was expecting, right? You know, this is not James Bond. There's no flying cars, you know. Um, there, yeah, so I mean, I think I, I was a bit delusional of really what I was getting into. And then the fear started to kick in when I was 30. And once you have the fear, your career is over. What do you mean the fear starts to kick in? When you're afraid of your job, right? You know, you're afraid to die. You know what I mean? You're questioning things. You become super paranoid. Your career is over. Because I couldn't function properly. I couldn't work properly. I was super aggressive. I was, somebody looked at me the wrong way. I don't ask <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> and mind you, in that, in that certain time in my life and in that position, I had a lot of power. And I can go down the highway at a 200 kilometers an hour, you know, and just put... There's a certain uh, police hat that we have. I put it on the dash so other police officers know what I am, who I am. Don't don't bug me. So that gets to your head. You know what I mean? And one of my biggest pet peeves is people in power abusing authority. And I was almost becoming like that because I was becoming very paranoid, right? Mm. Because eventually at the end, you know, there was an incident. There was um, an assassination incident on two officers that wasn't from our department, but from our station, Right. And then I was actually targeted at the end of that career part. That's kind of when I made the transition and kind of went into cycling, right? Um, but you know those things. I mean, you know, I didn't leave anywhere without my bread. I was always armed. I didn't sleep without 700 weapons everywhere. <laughs> I mean, super paranoid. So, you know, you can live that life for so long, but at some point it'll it'll start to eat you up, right? And my, I remember my mother noticing that when they gave me two weeks to come back home to visit my family, and my mom said I was a completely different person because you have to be. How can you be human and have those emotions and whatnot and do whatever you're you know, told to do when you almost have to become robotic? Hmm. How did you transition from being a spy, let's say, to your new life of uh, extreme sports? Well, it just started with the passion for my bike was my savior. Like it just found first, first it was my therapist. Right. You know what I mean? I just go out there and I'd win races because I, yeah, <laughs> and you think about things and you know, you're not thinking about the pain that you're going through. Right. Um, but I just started to love the sport of cycling. Right. And then I remember working and just saying, you know, I'm an athlete. This is what I need to do. And I felt like I was good enough because even with the minimal training that I was doing, I'd go into these races and I'd win. And, you know, in Israel, there wasn't any women at the time I'd be competing against the men. And, you know, people say, you know, you're good enough to be a pro, blah, 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 which is what I was, I mean, Israel, I was a small, you know, big fish in a small pond, right? You know what I mean, so of course I'm going to do great. And also my work too, it required us to be incredibly fit, right? You know, like I, it's not that you go to work and then, okay, you're done at five o'clock. You're, you're done whenever you're done, right? If you're given an assignment or something, you're done at five o'clock, you're done, at, you know, the next day or you're done two days later. So, you know, juggling that then finishing your shift and going out for a ride, whatever, train for four or five hours and getting two hours of sleep and coming back to work, you know, you get, you get mentally strong that way. Right. So that's why that this whole ultra endurance thing, you know, it wasn't going to say easy for me, but I felt like I had an advantage because of the life I was coming from in the Middle East. But it seems, it seems like, you know, some people would do the cycling as, you know, a bit of fun. But you, you, you seem to have like taken it to the next level where you're like winning, not just races, but the greatest races in the world. What was that about? I think just just pushing myself beyond my limits, right? You know, I just felt like it's something that I can do. And as you know, um, 
in ultra racing, even in running, as you can see, the playing field between men and women, it gets very even, right? You know, and I'm going to say anything over like 48 hours because then it's not physical anymore. It becomes mental, right? You are in pain. You are beyond pain, whatever. You've got saddle sores. Your muscles are aching. You're swelling. You're hallucinating. You know, you're super uncomfortable. So it's whoever, whoever can take it mentally, right? So I think that's the thing is I've gone we'll go back even to the military of the training that they would make us go through there, right? For example, in basic training, and I was put in a special unit that only, I think only 30 of us from 400 were recruited into. So an example would be, we would go out on a trek for like, say 40 kilometers. At, it will start at 6 p.m. Fully loaded with our M16s, whatever, Uzi, you know, through water. Well, they, you know, we come back the next morning, whatever, after, through many different exercises on route. The commanders would say, okay, you have, three hours to rest before your next, you know, assignment or whatever. So one commander would go, they shut the, the light from, because we all were outside in tents. Five minutes later, a new commander would come and go, you know, suit up again. We're going out again. Right? So it was, so if something sounds too good to be true, it's too good to be true. You know what I mean? And that's when they see people like, you know, the government are crying and whatever, this is inhumane, whatever, I'm going to die. So this is how they start to, you know, kind of eliminate the ones that can't handle it. And I mean, like I said, I always expected the worst. So when you're going through that kind of training, you know, race across America is really hard, but it's doable. You go, okay, I went through way worse than that. Right. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, can you explain to me exactly what race across a race across America is? Well, okay, so it's um, like I said, it's it's a it's a in kilometers about fifty two hundred kilometers, three thousand miles, and it's nonstop, right? So but again, ocean side really nonstop, like you don't sleep. Well, you have twelve days to do it, so you have to navigate your sleep very like. So how we did it, just because I mean. 12 days is the limit, but we want to win it, right? You know what I mean? So it's not 12 days, it's 10 days, you know? So how I, we raced it, like, you know, the first 42, 43 hours, it's nonstop. You go through the night, you're not, you know, the only time you get off the bike is a bike change because of the terrain or a clothes change, you know, or you have to go to the bathroom. It's the only reason, everything else, brushing your teeth, eating, drinking, everything else is on the bike, right? After 43, 40, like, you know, the, the next night, you take your first nap and that can be between 90 minutes to three hours tops. And then after that, you know, it's every 24 hours, you're going down for another 90 minutes or three hours. So, you, you know, you're going to do that over 10 days. So you can imagine what's happening to yourself and how difficult, right? And, and you have a crew too. And also the crew is very difficult. So they basically, it's like having a, a remote control with, with a car. And they're, because you don't know what you're doing. At, at one point in the race, I didn't even know what I was doing at two o'clock in the morning on my bike. And I'm kind of questioning, what the hell am I doing out here? So they have to kind of, you know, reprogram your brain and tell you you're good. But I knew I had to just sit on this bike and I had to pedal. So a lot of things are going through your mind as this happens, right? Because like one of the best ultra riders was actually a commando soldier from Yugoslavia. I think his name was Yurog, Yurog or something. He passed away, but he was one of the best uh, um, ultra riders in the world because of, I think mainly because of his background, right? Because that kind of training and intensity and the mental part of it is what's happening to you when you get on that bike. And and you did it in 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 ten days on a no, bike. No, my best tomorrow. my best my best round was the second time I did it was ten days and nineteen hours. But the the one the round that I won where we had that heat dome, it was eleven days because I had to stop multiple times for IVs because you know, you know it was 50, 50 to fifty three Celsius not for one or two days almost right across the country like it, that heat dome. I don't know if it happened. Oh, yeah, I, I remember getting, yeah, I, count, I remember yeah. something about that. Yeah, like that heat dome. Yeah, it's this that I mean, in Kansas, where it's normally quite pleasant, I mean, I had burned right through my jersey, I had blisters on my back, right? I mean, it was just, I mean, I can't even explain to you what I mean, that was almost harder than anything I did in the Middle East, right? To ride through that, you know, you try walking in 50 Celsius, right? You know, so it was and, and with that kind of temperatures, I mean, how hard do you really think you can push your body? So there was no records being broken. That round that I had won, it was a race of survival. Like you can even ask, you know, the first gentleman that that one that came in first for the mail was, you know, he said the same thing. That was just a race of survival. It sounds like a race for survival. It, well, yeah, Ram is anyways, right? You know, and if you look like after this, if you want to Google race cross America or whatnot, you'll you'll see kind of the clips and and people like you know, like sometimes the hallucinations are so bad. Like in 2019. 
I kept, you know, swerving on and when I was riding because I had panthers jumping at me and then, you know, big boulders, they turn into, you know, monsters and you don't know what's real, what's not real. Like a funny story is one time, you know, and I was being chased by wild pigs and I ignored it, right? I thought, oh, it's hallucinating, right? <laughs> My follow car, they lay on the horn and I'm scared. I go, what the hell? They, they go, they're pointing back. Goes, Those pigs are real. You know what <laughs> I mean? So that's, the, you know, so every time something you know, you know, they'd say, yes, the cow was real. Yes, the donkey is real. Yes, whatever. so they'd let me know via radio, because I'm radio to my follow car, right? Kind of to help navigate the hallucinations. I mean, I'm better now. I know that I can't look around too much. You just kind of have to look at the at the road and then that'll help kind of control the the intensity of what you're what you're not seeing, not what you're not really seeing. So, so a question I have for you is why? Why? Like that's a, I mean, I think, I mean, I think it's just, again, it's, I think it's the challenge of doing something that, you know, many people can't do of really pushing yourself beyond Me being one of them. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think in many ways, I, I know a lot about you that we're quite similar. Right. And also, and doing the things that you love, I think for me is very, very important. Right. You know, like, you know, I grew up in a Jewish household. So my father said I had to be a lawyer, a doctor, a dentist, you know what I mean? You know, because that's kind of, you know, but I said, I have to be happy in my life. You know, I can't do something somebody else, somebody else wants me to do. I have to do what I want to do, you know? Um, and so that was always important for me because the biggest influence I think is from doing the things that you love. Cause it's a one-time deal, as you know, was my grandmother when she was kind of sitting on her deathbed, you know, her last words to me when I was in the military is her saying that you never, ever want to, you know, say the words in your last, you know, you know, breath of life or whatever is the words I wish, or what if, you know, I mean, it's now or never, and there is no second chances when we get to that point. And so I live my life by that. And that was such a strong impact. That's why I had dedicated my book to my grandmother, right? You know what I mean? Because mm. I think that whatever you choose to do in your lifetime, that when you wake up in the morning, that you like what you do at the minimum, like better love what you do, you know? Because mm. um, like I said, this is this is a one-time deal, man. We don't get second chances. Yes, indeed. Tell me, do you do motivational speeches? I absolutely do. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 and what do you, uh, what is like the message of your speech? Um, I just think it's more inspiration, right? You know, like, Leon, I don't know if we go back to pro cycling. Um, I had the mother of all crashes in 2005. We're at 85 kilometers an hour. I actually landed on my face. Somebody had leaned into me because, you know, in the Peloton, like Tour de France racing, we race very close, right? So when one person goes down, it's like a domino effect. So I actually ended up because I had lots of plastic surgery. I mean, I lost my the bottom part of my face, basically my arm dislocated back there, clavicle broken. The first layer of skin was ripped right off all my ribs. I mean, most of my bones were broken. And I seriously thought that, that this is the end of my life. Right. And I'm lying there, you know. Um, and so and in based in Velo News, which is one of the biggest cycling magazines in the world, you know, they had said that my career is basically over, that the probability of me coming back was never going to happen. And doctors also diagnosed me as saying, you know, you'll never race again. And also the question about me being able to walk properly without a walker or a cane. So being that you're going through that kind of trauma, right. You know what I mean? Kind of at the point in my career where I finally had gotten there because I didn't excel in cycling. It took me eight years. I was 38 before I hit my peak when, oh yeah, I got these opportunities. And then in 30 seconds, it was all gone. Right. So I kind of talk about that, the recovery of that, coming back into pro racing even stronger than I did before and having the best years as a professional racers at the ages of 39, 40, 41, and 42. I talk about that. And I talk about getting hit by a car by somebody, and they know, well, three or four years later, some lady was texting. I was at a race in California. And I don't know if you heard of Redlands classic. That was my last race on the pro circuit. She ended up hitting me from the rear of the bike. This is crash number two, which ejected me right across the street. And then I ended up landing like this, like Superman in order not to fall on my head. And I had two compound fractures, both my arms snapped. So that's, and that year now is when I trained for my qualifying race for race across America. Right. You know, and so I talk about that, you know, so people say, you know, sometimes when you think your stories are bad, hearing other people's stories kind of puts you into perspective. Right. And I think for me, like, you know, speaking makes me super nervous and I can't really say, I super enjoy it. Right. Cause you know, I'm not comfortable in front of large crowds, but what keeps me going is the feedback I get after people saying, you know what, there's something you said that I just needed to hear and being responsible for helping others 
was something I had never felt before. And I've done a lot of big things, but it was a high 10 times greater than sending on any, on any podium, breaking any records. And I go, you know what, if I can help one person, then that uncomfortableness I get is worth it. And that's why I continue to speak. And you've clearly had a, a rather interesting life. And I find that people have had rather interesting lives. And that's clearly an understatement. It's been extraordinarily interesting. Thank I you. find that those people have something to share, something to give, something to, to it's like, it's like in some ways it becomes selfish not to share it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because I have been selfish. I've done everything for me, in my life, right. You know, for my high and enjoyment, but I, get so much joy like even when I help people training right and they win a race I swear to god that I feel more happy for them than I did for myself in any races I'm like and I'm nervous and I look at them and I watch them and I train with them and I'm so involved right because I know the feeling I know what it that you know what it takes uh, or the training it takes and the dedication it takes to get to certain places right and if I can help somebody you know even if I'm 10 percent responsible it's a hundred and ten percent you know, satisfaction feeling that I get afterwards. Right. You know, and I didn't realize it till I actually started speaking because, you know, the first time I was asked to do a, a presentation, I thought, Oh my God, this is gonna be my first and my last. Right. But like, as I said, that's what kind of kept me going. And, and I actually really am starting to love it now. <laughs> it's beautiful. I, I very much enjoy chatting with people who go out into the world and it's a cliche. I don't really want to say make a difference, but go out into the world and take their experience and touch someone's life in a way that that other person can make something better of themselves. Absolutely. It's the greatest feeling in the world. As you know, I'm, I'm sure hundred percent, you know, the feeling, and that's something that, man, it's, it's, it's so wonderful. I wish I knew that, you know, even 20 years ago. Right. But like I said, I'm, I'm very happy when I can, like I said, even in a room of a thousand, if I can touch one person, then I've done a good job. You have indeed. You know, I know you can't share a lot about your past on um, the podcast, but I actually may be coming up to Vancouver. How far away are you from Vancouver? Well, I'm not. I'm five hours. Actually, I live in both places. My parents are there and I work in Vancouver a lot. So you let me know, right? Because I'll make sure I'm in Vancouver. When I come up to Vancouver, I hope that maybe you can tell me some more stories. I can tell you. I'll tell you. Yeah. That, that won't yeah. be pod, when that person, won't be on person a podcast. To person. <laughs> Just me Absolutely. And you. Because, yeah, yeah. you know, I always thought, and I never did, but you never know, maybe I am. But I never did end up going down that route of the, the, the spy world, right? Like the intelligence world. But it's always, it's always been fascinating. Yeah. Um, and the skills that you need to, to like be in that world can be used in your everyday world, right? Yeah. Like I would say, that's actually my last question to you. What are some of the skills that you used in your career as a as a as a spy in your real in your real world life? How have you transferred them? That anything you want, like, like nothing is impossible. I think that's the main thing, is right, and also not afraid, being afraid of failure, using that as strength, not as a negative, but as a positive, um, and just diving in. Leon, it's a matter of your determination, your willingness to do things, and like I said, you can make anything happen. I mean, I'm going to tell you, you know, I see, and I'd like to send you a book, right? And I've, I've done a lot of many, many things, and everything that I've done in my life that I've wanted to do, I've done them. And mind you too, I don't have a special skill. When I was a little kid, I had a learning disability. I spoke with a lisp, was put in a special class. On the physical side, my left leg was growing at a faster rate than my right leg. It's longer, it's stronger. The foot is bigger and I don't have mobility on both ankles. So I was already like a reject considered when I was a little kid, right? You know, and then, you know, I talk to high risk youth groups and I tell them, you know, your past does not dictate your future, right? And I'm a very good example of that, right? So you know, being kind of at the bottom of the barrel, teacher saying, I won't be this, uh, you know, gym teacher saying, I'll never excel in sports, you know, and I knew it, but I never used it as a handicap. And I never, you know, I never let fear dictate my path. That's another big thing, right? You know, I'm, I'm not fearless, but it doesn't control me. I control it. I think there's not much more to say than that. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This is fun. Thank you. And thank you for being willing to like be part of this crazy experiment of a podcast where the 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 podcaster has no idea who he's going to talk to.
No, this is awesome because I always get asked the same questions, right? You know what I mean? So this yeah. is and it's funny because there's some podcasts where, like, I remember saying to this guy, I said, oh, my God, you know, it would be great if you wrote a book. And he said to me, yeah, I've written, like, 25 of them. I'm like, oh, God. So I'm... <laughs> Now, if there's anything I've missed, which I'm sure there's lots, I'm sorry. Yeah. I will go and Google you now, and then we'll go from there. It sounds good, yeah. And I apologize for the tardiness. I understood that we were on at 11, right? Because, you know, with me, I'm always early. I'm always 10 minutes early, so I apologize. No worries, no worries. <laughs> but thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. All right, yeah. Hello, everyone. It's Leon here, a.k.a. The Kindness Guy. If you like my videos, which I hope you do, don't forget to press the subscribe button and also to ring the little bell so that the notifications notify you that I have a new video out in the world.